Hey friends, welcome to One Little Coder's AI Weekly Review. In this week, we have a lot of papers, approximately 12 papers, predominantly multimodality, and also we have some bit of AI news to cover. Before we move on to the news section, I would like to kindly thank you for the kind words that you all shared with me on my recent community post. I truly appreciate each and every one of you here. So let's get started with the video. First paper that we should discuss today is Google DeepMind's Levels of AGI operationalizing progress on the path to AGI. We recently discussed that AGI does not mean any single thing. AGI could mean a lot of different things depending upon who do you talk to. OpenAI has got its own definition and someone else would have their own definition. So what Google DeepMind is trying to do here is that Google DeepMind is trying to put together like a framework of different stages of AGI. So if you go there, you would actually see that they have released different stages. Level zero, level one, two, three, four, five, and five is what they are describing as superhuman. The AGI, artificial general intelligence that outperforms 100% of humans. For somebody who doesn't know what is AGI at all, so AI, which we can, you know, describe, discuss a lot on this particular channel, artificial intelligence is predominantly ANI, artificial narrow intelligence. You ask AI to do a particular thing, it is really, really good at that particular thing. Image segmentation, text generation, text direction, sentiment analysis, text classification, you name a thing, AI is really, really good at one particular thing. But what AGI is supposed to mean is that something that is good at multiple different things, in fact, better than humans. And that's where the concept of agents and a lot of other things have been coming into the LLM world. And DeepMind is trying to standardize it more. <laughs> You know, strangely, Google does not release anything other than these kind of things. So that's that's quite funny thing. I think there'll be a lot of memes around what Google is releasing. But anyways, levels of AGI is a very interesting paper. Like I said, like they're defining like different stages, like six stages. The first one is no AI. The second one is emerging. That is like narrow AI, emerging narrow AI, competent AI. And you have got this is like at least the 50th percentile of skilled adults. So 50th percentile, anybody who knows statistics is the median. And this is looking at the median. This is looking at the top 90th percentile, which is expert virtuoso. This is the 99th percentile. And finally, they have got the superhuman outperforms 100% of humans. And they've got examples of alpha fold, alpha zero stockfish. Stockfish is the chess engine. Alpha fold is deep mind solution to discover new protein foldings. So Anyways, they are saying uh, they, they have given examples of um, alpha fold here, but they have said like not yet achieved, not yet achieved, not yet achieved, not yet achieved. So they are saying whatever we call currently like the AI, the chat GPT, the Bard and the Llama 2s of the world, they are calling it e level the level one and uh, it's emerging narrow AI. So it's like rule based systems. It's an interesting paper. Definitely check out and then understand what do you feel as AGA and what do they feel as AGA? What is the intersection of these two? The next paper is about accuracy of vision language models on challenging medical cases. This is a very non clickbaity title, but if I were to title this paper, I would say GPT-4 vision successfully beat human beings in understanding medical imaging, medical imaging. Um, so that's what I would like. If I, if I have to give a clickbaity title, that's what I would do here. What this paper has done is that this paper has taken 934 cases of uh, NDJM image challenge that was published between 2005 to 2023. And they've taken these 934 cases and given it to human beings and given it to GPT-4 vision to understand what is there. And they wanted to compare it and also stratified the question by difficulty of the case, image type, skin tone and all these things. And uh, what they realized, the result is actually astonishing. GPT-4 vision achieved an overall accuracy of 61%. Uh, the confidence interval is 95% confidence interval. So it ranges from 58% to 64% compared to 49%, which is again, 95% confidence interval, 49% to 50% for human beings. So human beings scored 49% on this 934 cases while GPT-4 vision scored 61% on these 934 cases and human GPT-4 literally outperformed humans at all different levels. It's, it's a statistically significant result. The only exception was radiographic images where uh, the performance was equivalent between GPT-4 vision and human respondents. So yeah, this is, uh, this is once again astonishing. I think in the past we have spoken about 
GPT-4 or other vision transformer models being used for uh, understanding X-rays seems like GPT-4 vision and uh, other vision language models could actually be a really good doctor assistant in the future for us to evaluate medical images like you know x-rays and all the other images the next one is a very interesting paper to be honest it comes from hong kong university of science and technology university of edinburgh university of waterloo a massive editing for large language models via meta learning when you build a large language model the large language models knowledge is frozen at time point t let's say t T plus 1, T plus 2, T plus 3, as the years go, the knowledge in the large language model might become obsolete. And that's where people started using solutions like RAG to supplement, like augment the knowledge while the model is generating a text. That's what retrieval augmented generation is. And people are constantly looking at new techniques. What this paper is doing is, this paper is introducing a new hyper network. So hyper network, is one of the techniques like LoRa, like um, you know something else. It's one of the techniques to imbibe new knowledge to the large language model. Hyper networks were very popular during the stable diffusion world to include new images to the stable diffusion model. So this this paper is building on top of hyper networks and in fact introducing a new massive hyper network, saying massive language model editing network, Malmen. So what they are trying to do with Malmen is they are trying to do something that calls that they are calling as formulates a parameter shift aggregation as the least squared problem. Subsequently, updating the LM large language model parameters using a normal equation. So while the large language model is generating something, they are trying to update the knowledge of it. That's what like my understanding of it. And uh, they to fit the system in you know computation that we can manage. They have separated the computation on the hyper network and LM, the large language model, uh, enabling like arbitrary batch size on both neural networks. So our method is evaluated by editing up thousands of facts on large language models with the different architectures like BERT base, GPT-2, T5XL, uh, GPT-J, which is the largest of all, uh, the 6 billion parameter model. And uh, they figured out that Malman is capable of editing hundreds of times of facts than strong baselines with near identical uh, hyper network architecture and outperforms editors specifically designed for GPT. They've also shared their code with them. So there is one interesting aspect they wanted to share in this paper. So they're evaluating this model or uh, this hyper network's performance based on three uh, metrics. One they're calling as editing success. Second, they're calling as generalization success. Third, they're calling as locality, locality success. So these are the formulas for it. And if you see, the way it is doing, so when you compare this uh, across these three success metrics, the ES, GS and LS, you can see in this particular chart that Malman is like significantly outperforming fine tuning and similar architecture called MAND. So Malman is like right at the top, the green color line across, you know, different, uh, different uh, uh, scaling curves. And you can see that it is actually doing a better job in uh, infusing or editing the knowledge of the large language model. And again, this paper has a lot of math. I didn't, um, I didn't understand it completely, I would say, to be honest. But I think this is a really, really interesting approach where you don't make the knowledge or the data that is available in a large language model completely obsolete, but rather you use some kind of techniques like in this case, like a massive hyper network to update the knowledge. Also, at, at this point, it's a very important thing to remind everybody that I think typically there is a notion in the industry, at least like a lot of AI consultants come into picture and then they say that, hey, um, you know, you, you th this language model does not have knowledge about your company. So I would simply use uh, fine tuning and then give knowledge about your company to this language model. That's not how language models work. Fine tuning can help you in steerability, like the kind of text it gives, like how do how does it follow instructions? Fine tuning can help you in des uh, getting an output in a particular theme. Fine tuning can help you in style, but fine tuning cannot completely change the knowledge. That's something that we need to keep in mind. Fine tuning can probably give a little bit of extra knowledge because you know it's all English at the end of the day. But fine tuning is not your uh, knowledge replacement per se. This LoRa serving thousands of concurrent LoRa adapters. So in fact. If you see this, you would uh, see a very interesting headlines. You can say, oh, in a single GPU, we can serve more than 1000 models. That's, that's, that's the clickbaity title for this. Like on a single GPU, you can serve more than 1000 models. Um, it's not necessarily 1000 models, it's 1000 LoRa adapters. So basically this paper is exploring 
how can you surf a lot of concurrent LoRa adapters like hyper network we just saw hyper network like hyper network LoRa I think low rank adapters are a technique with which you instead of fine tuning the entire large language model you fine tune certain layers of the large language model while freezing the other layers of large language model and this is what we have been doing with pift this is what is quite popular in the stable diffusion world where you can share your face and then you know add the style to it so lora is pretty popular like super popular at this point like you have a lot of lora adapters on hugging faces model up when you go or civet ai anywhere you see so now what this paper is exploring is not LoRa training, but actually serving LoRa. So how do you, how do you increase, uh, how do you serve LoRa adapters like at scale? And that's what this paper is doing. So to efficiently use the GPU memory and reduce fragmentation, S LoRa proposes unified paging. Unified paging uses a unified memory pool to manage dynamic adapter weights with the different ranks, KV key value cache tensors with varying sequence lengths. Additionally, S. LoRa employs a novel tensor parallelism strategy and a highly optimized CUDA kernels for heterogeneous batching of LoRa computation. So bottom line is, if you have got thousands of LoRa's or hundreds of LoRa's and you want to serve all of them on a consumer hardware like a CUDA enabled like NVIDIA GPU here, this is going to be extremely efficient for you. Collectively, these features enable S LoRa to serve thousands of LoRa adapters on a single GPU or across multiple GPUs with a small overhead. Compared to the state of art libraries like Hugging Face Pift or VLLM, which is one of the fastest. To be honest, like VLLM is absolutely like, according to me, like the, the things that I've explored, the fastest way of LLM inferencing with the uh, native naive support of LoRa serving. So VLLM is primarily specified for LLMs. I'm not sure how efficient they are for LoRa. Anyways, LoRa S LoRa can improve the throughput by four times and increase the number of served adapters by several orders of magnitude. That's why they're talking about 1000. As a result, S LoRa enables scalable serving of many task specific fine tuned models and offers the potential for large scale customized fine tuning services. The code is available here for you to use. This is another very interesting approach where the large language model is going to be shown to thousands of users because we have thousands of LoRa's to be served. And that's what this paper is exploring. How do you concurrently serve a lot of LoRa adapters? Most of these large language models that currently we discuss are all autoregressive models. So they are like uh, models that are uh, trained to generate new text like you give something input it's going to predict the next word or instruction fine-tuned model sometimes you have like, like the fill in the blank model so in the world of this auto regressive models people often forget that you know we have reinforcement learning even though reinforcement learning is being used for rlhf reinforcement learning from human feedback reinforcement learning is what openai started with i don't know how many of you here remember that way, way back when OpenAI started, OpenAI had something called OpenAI Gym. So people used to um, use the Dino game. Uh, I don't know if you remember the Chrome Dino game. So people used to train reinforcement learning models to make the Dino actually jump when it is the right time, when is there is an obstacle, they would make a man run. This was all used using OpenAI Gym. This is like probably like I think five, five years before. Um, I don't know the timeline exactly. If any of you have played with OpenAI Gym, please comment in the comment section. I would definitely love to see some old faces here. But um, what this paper is doing is this paper is actually trying something like that. So this is saying neural MMO 2.0, a massively multitask addition to massively multi-edged learning. <laughs> Too massively, a massively multitask addition to massively multi-agent learning. So what this is basically doing is this is basically trying to create like a reinforcement learning environment where um, one agent trained on a particular set of tasks, how well it can generalize beyond that particular task. Not just that they have this paper. So if you see this particular paper, you can see neural MMO features procedurally generated maps with 120 and 28 agents in the standard setting and support for up to version 2.1 is a complete rewrite of its predecessor with a threefold improvements and compatibility with clean RL. And uh, basically the idea is like train the agents capable of generalizing to tasks, maps and uh, opponents that were not seen during training. So as part of this paper, what they are also doing is they are actually running a contest where they're saying that you can win prizes up to 20,000. So objective train a team of eight agents to complete tasks in a simulated world. 
your team's policy generalizes to new tasks, opponents and maps. And you can see like this is basically a reinforcement learning track. And um, there are a bunch of sponsors like Stability, AI and MIT. The idea here is that you have an agent uh, who's like a reinforcement learning based agent who is expected to generalize better than what they are being trained for. And you can see like a bunch of resources. You have got like uh, tools and techniques and all these things. So if you're interested in reinforcement learning, definitely participate in this and then see, um, you know, if you win Otter HD. So currently all the multimodal systems that we have got are uh, not necessarily for very high resolution images. So this paper is a uh, kind of an evolution from Fuyu 8 billion parameter. So it's Otter HD 8 billion parameter specifically engineered to interpret high resolution visual inputs with granular precision. So they also have introduced something called magnifier branch an evaluation framework designed to scrutinize models ability uh, to see the minute details and spatial relations of the smaller objects on the picture particularly. This is this is the picture that they have got. So particularly what they have done is um, there is a current bottleneck in the existing systems based on the visual encoder. So changing that they have managed to do this for a high quality input. So um, that 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 so the conventional models are uh, constrained by the fixed size vision encoders. Like for example, if you have stable diffusion, you know, you can generate like 512 by 512 or 124 by 120 or 1024 by 20, 1024. So they are trying to overcome that with uh, with what they are calling as Otter HD. So that can handle flexible input dimensions and uh, they have got details about, you know, how their system is really good. Like for example, if you see this example, so this is a picture that they uploaded. Honestly speaking, I don't have much of a clue what is it. So it says what's inside the painting and it goes on detailing like what is there in the model. So it gives you all the details and then they have a follow up question. How many camels are there inside this image? How many camels are there? Um, as a human, I give up. Um, please don't kick me out of humanity. But at least at this point, I don't have a uh, really good ideas. Uh, but um, it says there are three camels visible in this image. I don't know if it is correct or wrong, but uh, this is an image of 2466 by 1766 and Otter HD, Otter, Otter, Otter is the animal, right? Yeah, Otter, Otter HD is capable of handling that. And they've also done some comparisons between the current existing state of the art open source models like Edifex, Instruct Blip, Lava 7 billion, Quen VL and the Fuyu model. And they have uh, taken Otter HD and then, then said, said like they're really good at a lot of these kind of tasks. Next is a model that we have discussed in the past, uh, which is like a combination of multiple systems put together to get some multimodality. So next chat in that case is um, an LM LMM large multimodal model for chat detection segmentation. Now you might be wondering what is that? So it's uh, anyways, it's from NUS Singapore, Alibaba group, um, NUS and Alibaba. So basically what they have is it can take three inputs, text, image, bounding boxes. Anybody who has worked in computer vision CV, you would know that bounding boxes play a very important role, sometimes very helpful for visual grounding. So what they are doing here is that they have designed a system or uh, they have built a large multimodal model or a combination of tools coming together and creating a multimodal model that can understand text, image and also bounding boxes. To enable this large language model or large multimodal model, understand bounding boxes, they have created a special token called trigger. So the trigger token basically tells the system that you should understand the bounding boxes. And I'll give you an example. This is an example. So the example is if you see the next chart, you can upload an image and then say um, in this image, where is the bear to the left of the region? So you have a region box and you're saying where is the bear to the left of the region? And uh, this model is capable of just masking that particular bear that is to the left of the bear that has been bounded. So that is that is what basically this model is really good at. And uh, the, this model is basically a combination of a bunch of things. One for the vision encoder, they are using a clip with L14 encoder. Second for chat, the, the language part, they're using the Llama 2 model. And for the bonding boxes and the image detection, they are using a pixel to M method that they are using. And they have got like an image segmentation system as well. They are using basically SAM uh, from a segment anything model from a meta AI for the segmentation. 
and you can see a bunch of examples about how it is helpful like for example you can go ahead and then ask a question where is the bear wearing the red decoration in the image so you can it can create a bounding box for you it can segment the image and you can say where is the skateboard in the image and it can particularly create a bounding box for you and give you the skateboard and there are like multiple other uh, help use um, if you if it can understand text image and also the bonding boxes and they're they're giving these examples about where it could be more helpful next one is uh, can llms follow simple rules this is talking about how robust the current llms are for adversarial attacks or manual or automated adversarial attacks when you do jailbreaking how does it perform and they're also releasing a new rule following language evaluation scenario which is like a, a programmatic framework for uh, measuring the LLM's rule following ability and uh, it has like multiple categories like different attack strategies and all those things. So basically uh, when uh, LLM's are going to be deployed one of the things that people are worried about or uh, concerned about is um, how can somebody break into it like we have uh, discussed techniques like jailbreaking prompt injection and all the other techniques even with uh, chat GPT's latest release called GPT's a lot of people are putting data into it and then deploying GPT's and recently I saw somebody had uh, just <laughs> asked chat GPT to give the source file the CSV and it managed to give it like we, even it was sensitive data so that is where this paper uh, goes into the details of how can you understand the rule following ability and uh, uh, how can you make the LLMs more robust and uh, they have got this rules the framework here and uh, they have uh, checked it against their test cases across open models across proprietary models and uh, they have uh, you know given you these scenarios and uh, this cases how you can see all these models so like you have the six scenarios that we discussed one is just ask indirection legalese obfuscation rule change and simulation and uh, simulation could be like um, you know uh, i don't know how many of you remember like the dan uh, do anything um, this is like the very early days of chat gpt we would try to create like an alter ego of chat gpt that would be that is like basically like a rogue version of chat gpt can do anything those are like fun days like uh, very olden days of chat gpt like the next one uh, is what i was um, alluding to the last two papers on road with gpt vision early explorations of visual language model on autonomous driving in the past we have already explored a concept where somebody used a large language model for vision uh, especially for uh, the self driving or the driving capability autonomous driving and now we have uh, this paper from a bunch of universities from uh, uh, China, Shanghai and like also Shanghai AI laboratory. So what this paper along with the code that they have released is trying to do is it's trying to use GPT-4, make GPT-4 as a, you know, the eyes of this AI system and do autonomous driving. And uh, it's a, again a very interesting aspect like uh, it's a very large paper but you can see like uh, for example this is what you see behind the wheel please count how many vehicles are in the scenario and describe each vehicle so it goes on to the details about reading the image and then saying what is in that and uh, you again can uh, you know give more elaborate prompts and then it can give you more details and uh, you basically use this entire thing to actually steer or uh, create an autonomous driving system and uh, it, you know you can deploy it i'm still skeptical about using these kind of models um, primarily uh, for an autonomous driving system but again like in the last video i have got a lot of uh, optimistic comments that uh, actually said this is quite possible and you know some of our subscribers are working on that kind of system so it'll be interesting to see what how this is um, growing but again this paper and if you see the previous paper that we just compared like how LLMs can be broken, how LLMs follow rules, jailbreaking, adversarial attacks. If you if, if I'm going to be, on a, be in a car that has uh, large language models um, that can actually steer like the direct the drive the car for me. I think it's very important that the car is like the solution or the tech is robust. I don't want somebody standing next to me you know just using like a jailbreaking technique to break into the cars driving capability and then driving me so i think it's it's, uh, it's quite early days but uh, it's it's good that people are exploring and this is exactly where like the models like otter hd uh, otter otter hd will help because now 
the existing vision models even with gpt4 may not be that good uh, in observing everything in the scene but imagine like you have got a uh, you have got like this high resolution pictures a model like otter hd can actually read it i don't know how many of you also know this thing but uh, typically most of the self driving cars have been relying on a technology called lidar very similar like uh, like laser technology it just beams rays and gets a signal back but tesla on the other hand like people like elon musk have repeatedly said that they will not use lidar and they would rather go with like imaging techniques like one that we are seeing today so i don't know what kind of uh, what kind of advantages this will give for the self driving or autonomous driving capability but uh, yeah it's a very interesting approach from once again from china um, i feel like this time we have a lot of papers from china or at least like the non us universities i don't know if you have anything about it the next paper lava plus learning to use tools for creating multimodal agents it is from shinghua university uh, microsoft research redmond and uh, university of wisconsin madison this is performed during an internship at microsoft okay lava is a very popular multimodal model we already know lava model we have tested lava model it's it's a really good model what this is trying to do is this particular project is trying to create uh, like a bunch of uh, tools for the lava model that you can use the lava model with so it's a, it's basically like creating like an app store ecosystem for lava model so this is the visual illustration of lava plus capabilities so this is the lava model you can upload a model and it can tell you basically what is it so now what the lava plus capabilities are trying to do is it's trying to give uh, all these things into lava model in itself like conditional generation editing the image point to multi level segmentation box to segmentation stroke to segmentation and there are certain places where this can be really helpful like for example you can use it for object segmentation and detection okay where is the lake where is the bridge semantic segmentation you don't have to specifically say what is it you just let it do the segmentation oh you are just extracting text search you combine it with external knowledge and then say where is this particular place use it for social media post like you can literally take this and then ask it to generate like a new image and because it can understand image segmentation it can put cats on the particular place and then create social media post for you that is basically composition like so it can basically do all these things and uh, that's what this paper is about this paper is about a new system called lava plus that can give that multimodal that can give those tools for the existing lava solution and you can go here and then see the code is available the data set that they used is available for you to use and you can also see how you can use this how this entire thing works if you go to their github repository about their architecture it's not necessarily completely a different model this is building on top of lava giving you that ecosystem of tools to make lava lava plus the next one is not necessarily like mind blowing ai but for me at least like personally i have never heard of this thing this is a paper that says just with a voice like you know using like a simple smartphone voice you can predict whether somebody has got a type 2 diabetes mellitus so you can predict whether somebody has got t2dm t2dm it's like a tongue twister and the accuracy of the solution that they have got is actually good so they have one so they have first figured out like significant differences between the voice recordings of non diabetic and the voice recordings of diabetic t2dm men and women and the models that they have used are not like you know like large language models uh, gpt vision models they have simply what they have done is they have used models that are uh, pretty popular already so they have used uh, let's say logistic regression they have used um, they have used logistic regression gaussian um, naive bias svm uh, support vector machines and these are the models that they used to actually build this particular solution they've used like a five fold cross validation so you know it gives me more um, trustworthiness when i see this data that they are not just simply overfitting so it's a very simple architecture to be honest like voice data comes in they extract the features and uh, they build the model and then they do the model evaluation and uh, they have figured out that uh, out of uh, out of you know they've got like 267 participants um, with the different genders and um, yeah they have figured out that they have got like a statistically significant difference in doing the classification of uh, diabetic and non diabetic people and i wanted to cover this particularly because um honestly like we are obsessed bombarded um with large language models and uh, in fact like i am one of the con contributors of this like in th this channel we cover a lot of large language models uh, cutting edge ai hot news breaking news fancy stuff but sometimes you know you can use the classical machine learning which is 
what is this paper is proving that you can still use like classical machine learning techniques. I mean, even later on, you can improve this with deep learning and um, all the, the latest transformer based models. But simply by using classical machine learning, you can still make a difference uh, in a lot of different domains that is not directly closely linked to computer science. And that is exactly what this paper is proving that using like a logistic regression, uh, naive bias, like Gaussian naive bias, support vector machine. These are not even like XGBoost level models. These are like mostly parametric models. And using these models, you can build a statistically significant um, model that can uh, differentiate between T2 DM, like a diabetic voice and non-diabetic voice. I never knew <laughs> that, you know, using voice, you can predict whether somebody has got a diabetes or not. And um, that is what this paper is about. So if you're really interested in medical science with AI, with ML machine learning, in the next section, we're going to see some very generic AI news. The first one is uh, this new tool called Humane, uh, not a tool, it's a, it's a product. Uh, it's like the, what they call as AI pin that you can like pin it on your shoulder and you can talk to it. And um, before, before I'm going to um, give my rant about this product. Many years ago when Google Glass was launched, I was a big fan of Google Glass. Not a lot of people liked it, but I liked it. At that time, I liked it for a lot of reasons, uh, primarily for a new wearable. So I'm always a big fan of new wearable. I don't use a smartwatch. Um, I find it very boring. But anyways, I'm a fan of new wearable um, that is different from your traditional uh, computers or uh, iPad and uh, uh, smartphones. This is a new product um, that supposedly has an on-device AI and you can use it for a lot of different things. And this tool is ideally somebody's like personal assistant that you stick to on your, um, you know, like chest. The reason why I don't like this tool is uh, one, you're constantly like, let's say like you have something like this. Okay. I have like, I have like an old um, pen drive here, like a terrible pen drive. People are constantly like, what is my meeting tomorrow? They're like, can I eat this? Can you calculate the calories? I think this is super awkward. This is like typical uh, dystopian Silicon Valley stuff. And I'm not a big fan of typical uh, dystopian Silicon Valley stuff. So I'm not a big fan of this product, Like, but um, if you're a big fan of this product, definitely, definitely go check it out. And you can go here and then learn more about it. In fact, you can get to know the tech details of it, like what kind of devices, what kind of stuff goes into it. I think they have done a lot of hard work in uh, um, perfecting the uh, form factor of it. I like the form factor of it. It looks, when you look at outside, like it's it's almost like the smart uh, Apple watch without the, um, the straps. It looks nice. Uh, it has some, uh, what they're calling as a perpetual charging. Like when you walk, it charges, wireless charging is there. It has got a camera that can take photos, videos, and uh, it has got a really good chip that can do on device AI. So it has got like octocore Qualcomm Snapdragon 2.1 gears, accelerated on device AI, 4 GB RAM and uh, 32 GB eMMC storage, everything within like a very small device. Um, I'm honestly impressed about the technology that it has got, but personally, like, will I use it? No, I wouldn't use it. Will I like somebody seeing, will I enjoy seeing somebody using it? No, I don't. Uh, I think Apple um, Vision Pro has a very similar uh, kind of like a, um, confusion among people. Like, will you wear it in a public place? Maybe that's not the use case it for, but the way they have shown the demo of this tool is like people wearing it in public places, going to grocery store, going to buy vegetables and being with friends and family. And uh, I'm not, I mean, I take my smartphone, but at least like, you know, I think it's quite common like among human mis human beings at this point, but I'm not going to be like, like this. Uh, can you take a picture of this? <laughs> it feels like I'm a spy. I, I, I'm not going to do that, but this is a very impressive new product launch from a company called Human, and this product is called AI Pin. Samsung launching a new LLM, and uh, this LLM is uh, supposedly going to be on device. It's called Samsung Goss. Goss. So they have uh, partnered up with the Korean uh, university, and they have uh, launched a new language model. And this language model is uh, supposedly uh, good at uh, generating text, creating emails, coding tasks, and all the other things. And Samsung Goss image also has got like a generative model. Uh, uh, do you remember Samsung's moon zoom image uh, where, you know, they were using deep learning to create like an overlay of new moon picture. Anyways, and not to pick on Samsung, but yeah. Um, so 
seems like samsung is jumping onto the llm uh, band uh, wagon um, and uh, it seems like they are focusing on on device large language models that could be deployed within samsung devices the next one is once again a new large language model from uh, amazon uh, again rumors it's called uh, olympus um, this is supposedly like a 2 trillion parameter language model and uh, amazon wants to take on like gpt4 models at this point honestly i'm not very sure how useful and impactful it is to take on gpt4 but uh, i'm happy that uh, you know companies with heck a lot of money are putting together resources and uh, trying to create these models i would uh, i would happily use it if they decide to open source i think that is the route that meta has taken uh, somehow open has not taken that route and um, would be happy to see if amazon is going to do that like they're going to be like cutthroat um, versus open open ai in this particular case but like, anyways like we have a new two trillion model the reason why when companies like uh, x twitter or uh, amazon when they were to release a model it's good is because I think they have got really, really good data. Say, um, you take Amazon Alexa, you, have, you take Amazon.com, um, the review section. I think uh, RLHF is what making a lot of models um, extremely good at uh, receiving instructions, um, following human instructions, and a lot of other things for supervised fine tuning. And these models have like you know thumbs up, thumbs down. Like X, uh, if you see Grok, I think it has got Twitter data, which can you know make a model really good at something, not good at something. So I'm excited about these kind of uh, comp big big tech releasing their own large language models. I just wish it is open source model. But the final one of uh, today's news is that I wanted to let you know that I recently came across this tweet. Um, no, I don't have any affiliation with this at all. So Nat Friedman, a very popular uh, figure in the AI funding space, uh, is interested in funding early stage startups, building evil capabilities for AI models, evils for AI models. So if you are working on this, please get in touch. Um, I think if you are watching our channel, I think you have a lot of good potential to probably one of the be become one of these startups or create at least solutions that can have like robust evil skills. I think recently we have discussed a lot about data contamination, benchmark leak, and all these other things. Even today, we covered a bunch of papers that were actually releasing like a benchmark with the data set. So if you if you are interested build build an evil startup uh, evil focused startup and maybe get in touch with nat friedman who might probably fund your uh, startup and you might thank me later i hope this uh, collection of news the hand picked papers that i had uh, was helpful for you let me know in the comment section what do you think about this ai news and uh, see you in another video happy prompting